probably several instances in your own lives when you've spoken to someone older than you and they've very strenuously argued in favor of buying a house. They say that it uh, creates your own physical asset, um, there is security associated with it and then there's the emotional well-being that you feel when you go and live in your own house. But there is also a case to be made against buying a house, especially early in your career. To talk about whether it's absolutely essential to buy a house, I have with me Anil Vego, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Right Horizons. Thank you so much, Anil, for taking the time. And this is a bit of a, a tough uh, conversation to have. It's not the, uh, it's not something that has a very straightforward answer because in India, more than anything else, you have gold and you have real estate that is valued very highly. Um, but from a financial standpoint, from good financial planning, I want to know, is it absolutely essential to own a house? Yeah, so if I actually look at it from a completely from a financial perspective, uh, and, and we did compute the numbers as well, you know, to validate that, and probably I'll share that over this conversation. Uh, actually, it does not make sense to buy a house at certain stages of one's life. Uh, and, and that especially is at an early stage uh, when, let's say, you buy a house which is disproportional yeah, as an asset versus all your other financial assets. Uh, if you are, say, further in your journey and uh, you have a large asset base, as part of it you want to buy a house, then that may not make as, as much of an impact. But at a time when you are in your wealth creation journey, right, and early stages when resources are scarce, you go and pay an EMI and you pay interest on that, uh, it, it robs your ability to be able to, say, invest in an SIP or a mutual fund. And, and when we calculated the numbers, interestingly, you know, it, it, it threw up uh, certain surprises. So, so I think at, at uh, uh, an overall level, uh, just to summarize, I think, it doesn't make sense to uh, look at investing in a house. Uh, a lot of the time, it's an emotional decision uh, that one takes because maybe it's come down from our parents and you know we are used to it. it. Sometimes it gives us safety and comfort as well. But keep in mind that it may increase risk for you because of the home loan that you take and the liability that you bring on yourself and your family. You know, there are various... Uh aspects to unpack in this entire conversation and you've mentioned a few but let's focus on uh, this statement that it brings you security uh, what i want to understand is you're creating a physical asset uh, but you're taking it on loan you're, it's essentially it's hypothecated to you uh, and the bank is the owner you're repaying a certain amount of money every month and once you've completed the payment, you then are the full owner in the rightful sense of that property. Is it then true to say that there is security associated with buying a house, especially if you're taking it on loan? Actually, no, because, and let me give you an example, and that's the best way of going about it. Uh, recently, we came across, you know, it's a very unfortunate incident where uh, a person who we, you know, in our layout passed away. And... Uh, uh, there was a there was a loan on it, right? So so today the family is now you know has to grapple with having to repay that loan. Uh, unfortunately, there was no term cover which was there, and insurance cover to sort of uh, cover the loan as well. And and that becomes a very uh, you know moot point that you you have a real issue. And assuming that even one doesn't see such an extreme situation, right? If if your asset value is say one crore, and I've taken a loan of 80 lakhs, actually your net asset is only 20 lakhs, right? And over a period of time, it grows in terms of an asset. So so I think people have a false feeling of security, uh, you know, without looking at the numbers. The that uh, comes up is the level of appreciation of real estate. Uh, they say land is the scarcest commodity. Uh, and in a sense, uh, real estate is an extension of that. There's only so much available and therefore the value is expected to only keep rising. Uh, the argument for buying a house early then is to reduce the cost that you would incur in the future. Is that a flawed argument and why? 
See, maybe in the past, real estate has delivered much stronger returns. And from that perspective, yes, if the asset is growing fast and your cost is, say, lower than your growth of your asset, uh, then so you are creating, you know, an additional asset base for yourself. Okay. But in recent times, we've seen that uh, the growth rate of real estate has come down substantially. And one cannot take it for granted that, say, real estate will grow at 12% plus. Okay. And this is all in the current scenario where real estate is scarce. Okay. Uh, I think population has grown, etc. And, and, uh, one keeps in mind that that not necessarily stays the same all the time, right? If, if one looks at, uh, there are trajectories of, let's say, growth in population and, you know, uh, you're finding that more mature economies, for example, are having the other problem that, you know, uh, they're having more seniors than, you know, younger people. So I'm saying that, you know, that cannot just be one basis for you to look at it. Uh, yes, there could be other assets which are also scarce. If I go by the same uh, logic, uh, you know, right from commodities to, you know, uh, other assets. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you also have, you know, diversification, which could mean that if I look at, say, financial assets, uh, they are continuously improving because, let's say, if you are investing in a stock, for example, uh, and an index, that index is continuously improving. It's throwing out companies which are not doing well and it moves on. And, and people have to fight up and, you know, keep creating value for the stock price and market to grow. So, so there are uh, different ways of looking at it. Um, I think just looking at saying the scarcity as a basis of making that decision, I don't think is, is, uh, can be the only criteria. The argument in favor of buying a house that is made is that it's a great investment. Uh, and we've heard this in uh, dinner parties where, uh, you know, a property was bought, say, in 1992 or 95. The value was a uh, few lakhs then. It is now worth a few crores now. And because of the mammoth increase in uh, or, or the difference between the acquisition price and the current value, you tend to imagine that this is a spectacular return. Is that also a flawed percep perception? Yes, yeah, so, but I also think it, it was something uh, a little bit more of the past. And we actually saw good, you know, growth in say real estate. Now, uh, is that the only avenue which has done very well? Not necessarily so. So if I look at uh, the Sensex, for example, and, and uh, the Sensex index starts at 100 and it started in 1979. And assuming that, just look at, assume a round figure, say 50,000 of the Sensex, right? So which means it's gone up 500 times from 1979 to today. Okay. So uh, the question is about whether I invest into assets, I let it grow uh, and let it compound, uh, then we need to see what is relatively a faster compounding asset. Okay, And globally studies have shown across countries um, and across longer periods of time, say uh, fixed assets like real estate have grown uh, slower than say financial assets, Okay, especially equity oriented assets. So, so one needs to, I think, uh, look at a slightly broader perspective, uh, educate oneself on various as, uh, assets. But at the same time, I'm not saying don't invest in real estate. I, I'm saying look at it maybe as a diversification. Look at it when you can afford it. If if I'm buying real estate and it's, say, 15% or 20% of my portfolio, then that's fine. But if I'm buying it and it's 70% of my portfolio, that's why I'm, I'm coming heavily against it. Right? As a diversification, okay, good to have but not the significant asset base or very high skew along with taking risk on yourself with a loan. It's interesting that you point that out uh, because I'm, I'm sensing that you say that you need to uh, differentiate between buying real estate as an investment uh, and buying real estate with the intention of staying in it. Uh, but to talk a little bit more about the numbers that you're speaking about, there are studies that suggest that at various stages of life, you need to be at a certain corpus uh, if you are to take care of your retirement, uh, you know, there are multiples of two times your annual income at a certain age, I believe at around 30. We did a show recently where we talked about that. Uh, and the uh, argument that I have or, or the question that I have is that if you are a 30-year-old, you're earning 15 lakh of rupees every year. Uh, if you have accumulated 30 lakhs of rupees, uh, and this is a nest egg that you want to build over a period of time, if you're in a place like Mumbai, and you need to buy a property, you're talking about buying a property that's worth at least 1.2 or 1.5 crore, and if not more. Uh, so you put the entire 30 lakhs into your down payment and you pay 
uh, uh, you know, an EMI for the rest of what could be 15 years. Um, the, the point that I'm trying to raise or the question that I'm trying to ask is, is that a terrible idea? Yeah, actually, if I looked at your numbers and here, yeah, let me give you an example. We looked at a, say, a round figure of buying a property of a crore and, and that would be assumed only a 20 lakh down payment. Okay. And we assumed, you know, interest rate of something like seven and a half percent. Now, uh, if it goes up, you know, the situation will get worse for it. We looked at property growth of somewhere around, let's say, seven percent or so. Uh, and, uh, so if I look at something like that, you know, uh, and versus, uh, putting the same, uh, you know, one crore renting, uh, using it, uh, or renting out a house uh, at say a 2.5% or so, so rental yield, okay, and paying uh, rent. I also increased rent at say 3% per annum, okay, and so so it was a growing figure, and we did all of that, uh, you know, and uh, it was interesting to note that almost like. Uh, uh, the difference was depending on, you know, how you look at a few parameters. Anyway, between 60 lakhs to um, 80 lakhs or so higher, if you actually invested it out and you also bore the higher rental cost year by year. That okay, I, I assumed a, say, a 12% type of return uh, on, let's say, the uh, SIP that you've invested into. Uh, I didn't assume it completely equity. Uh, and high risk equity at 15%. So I assume, you know, you do a combination of uh, mutual fund SIPs and, you know, you'll probably have built, uh, you know, that much more. And this is over what I we completed over a 15 year period. It's important to stress the importance of what you have just said because you've, if anything, you've underestimated uh, the rate of return that you can get on uh, investing uh, consistently. You've uh, overestimated, in a sense, what real estate can yield you. 7% is not something that we've seen over the last 6-7 years. We've seen something more like 4%, sometimes even less than that. Uh, and we're also talking about something that you own yourself. You're not likely to sell the house that you're living in simply because the value has gone up. Um, unless you're moving to a bigger place, in which case you will have to deploy capital again. So uh, I would like to come to the next point, which is you say that you need to understand the factors uh, behind buying a house. What are those factors? At what point can you decide that you may be early in life, but at what point can you decide that you can go out and buy a property? Yeah, so I think uh, a safe thing to assume is that if I'm also able to diversify, if I'm able to do my real estate and I can also diversify and let's say invest in an SIP and other financial assets um, and say real estate, uh, you know, is not uh, forcing me to take a very high loan and create liability on my family. Okay, because see, they, why also... Uh, the investment works better is because you're not paying that much of interest, right? So in the example that I gave, uh, a crore would result in almost like you making 1.5 crores uh, of payment, including interest. So, so that, you know, that takes away a good part of your return. So, so that is uh, the whole point of where you need to look at it at a, a slightly wider perspective and then compute for yourself. So when can somebody, you know, uh, look at it and what maybe is the tipping point for one? So possibly if you've built up a certain financial assets as a backup, uh, if you don't have to take too large a loan, sometimes say you, you may get a windfall, some e-shops or something else, money comes in, okay, uh, or you've sold some land and, you know, uh, utilized some money from that. Uh, so, so, so you can actually uh, look at investing in uh, real estate if, uh, I think just as a thumb rule, I can say, uh, you know, you're able to put, say, 75% of your assets uh, into, uh, let's say, diversified assets and keep your real estate restricted to about 25%. And that's practically impossible if you're talking about buying property uh, in Mumbai for most people unless they've reached a certain scale in their life. So effectively, we're talking about waiting for a while and deferring your purchase of a home till you achieve a certain scale. But... The other question that I have, and you've talked about the opportunity cost. You said that if you don't buy a property, if you live on rent at a rental yield, again, I forgot to mention, you've said 2.5%, but 2% or less is what you see in several places as well. Uh, what is the cost of 
owning and maintaining a flat in your experience in your conversation uh, with people over the years do people tend to underestimate that cost yeah so in fact in my example i have not even considered that cost right so and uh, if i have not done it probably most people also underestimated themselves okay so uh and and true because i have seen that over the years let's say especially after the first 3 4 5 when you go to 10 years 15 years the maintenance cost also goes up there may be uh, if you are buying an apartment the maintenance you are paying uh, to the apartment uh, owners association you know so all of these are ancillary costs when you add up it may just get you know a lot more worse for you uh, another argument and i've heard this quite often and and people are very helpful with the examples that they give me as well is that you know uh, i'm 63 years old i've got uh, one property in uh, vasai i've got one property in virar it gives me a rent of such and such and i don't need to worry about a pension because it takes care of my daily needs from that perspective do you think that real estate can be considered or even uh, or, or even there would you say that financial assets are better Well, especially for you know retirement, uh, I think using real estate is not a good idea at all because of the low rental yields that it gives. If if you are in, you know bought a property and gave it out on rent, now the issue is that it may not be growing in line with inflation. Okay, maybe the property value may also go up, but your rent over a period of time you will find shorter. And for the same monthly income that a financial asset may give you, you know you may have to invest that much more. Okay, in in real estate, and it may not catch up with you now. It will catch up with you later. So that is maybe for a senior person. In fact, for a junior person, I will say uh, the other is the opportunity cost of where you missed out this. Let's say in the example I gave that sixty to eighty lakhs in a very critical part of your uh, asset building. Now, if you did that, possibly you know in a later date you could put down this uh, you know additional sixty four lakhs and use it at down payment and uh, you know maybe. Top it up uh, later on, and and that time it may be possible, but but you know you may just miss out even for a younger person. So, in conversations that you have, uh, and I'm hoping that you can tell us about uh, the younger people that you've met as well. Um, do they buy houses or uh, tend towards buying houses at the uh, to the detriment of the rest of their financial goals? Do they say that? Look, I have plenty of time before I retire. I can start saving for my retirement later. And how how much of an implication does that have on their final uh, retirement savings that they have? Yeah, I expect uh, you know the buying of houses by millennials to actually be much much lesser, you know, over a period of time because they may not want to take the whole headache of maintaining it. Secondly, uh, the risk that it adds, and thirdly, the flexibility. Right, so. Uh, you know i think over a period of time you may just find people start using service apartments more people start saying you know what okay let me just rent out let me not buy we are finding a larger number of people today with with a wider exposure to all assets okay say i don't want to buy a property right uh, it's it may not be true in the higher age groups you know where you've come down over the years but today i think millennials are willing to question those uh, you know the past uh, dogmas that we have Okay, and say yes. Uh, let me do what is financially more uh, better, because you know today maybe the the internet and and the information that you get is a leveler. So there's a lot more information, and people have tried out various things. They've tried out higher risk, and even over a period of time, I found you know uh, people even at a forty years, if they have been exposed to various assets, some of them choose to say, "I will not buy a property." Uh, fair point. Uh, but how do you get around the emotional aspect of it which is uh, that niggling issue of security uh, you are living on rent there is a feeling that that rent is uh, you know down the drain because it's not really creating any value uh, and there's also the aspect of uh, you know if i lose my job and if i don't have an income um, assuming that i own a property that property will give me the security to say that okay i have a window of 6 months or one year before i can yield something again i can earn something again and i have that security how do you get past that see i think over time i think as the as the economy matures right some of the decisions uh, may come in a little more easily as well okay uh, because if you see maybe in countries like india 
uh, real estate is a much higher portion of you know uh, one's asset maybe in you know more developed uh, countries like the us and uk uh, it, it is sort of a lesser proportion and they may even invest in real estate as a financial asset right so so it it could mean that you know i i i look at what is sort of yielding me more because you just look at it this way one is i stay in a rented house and i invest in a uh, uh, let's say a fund which invests into commercial real estate and gives a 5 7% yield right that will be far far superior than you know going and uh, buying the rent uh, you know and invest you know taking a property on rent uh, uh, sorry buying a property and taking dmi so so that i think as time goes by it will evolve and people will see from them for themselves because even uh, today i'm saying uh, certain uh, aspects like you know if you go to the us you cannot even think of uh just living your retirement off and fixed deposit or debt avenues right so i think these will change here as well when sort of interest rates come down okay and you find that financial assets do better okay and uh, uh as as there's more exposure to various asset classes for people i think uh, that's something that will change one last point and we spoke last week when the reserve bank of india had that off cycle rate increase and i know that in your example you had 7.5% which is accurate if you talk about the report uh, where it is right now because 40 basis points is the increase one would assume that uh, housing loans right now available at close to that level um, but we're talking about the possibility of another percentage point from this point to march 2023 so by next year this time one could see housing loans at 8.5% or maybe at least over than over that 8% mark is now not definitely not a good time in terms of uh, the interest cost to buy a house no well, still at, at this point of time i think the interest rates are still lower than the past because we've seen uh, 9 10 11% in the past right? so it, it is still much better okay the uh, yes what it does even to the equation you know that i captured say 7.5% as an assumption right if that goes you know higher then it will make your investing in real estate even worse right so uh, it definitely does have an impact and our view also is that interest rates should you know continue to move higher i am not sure it will move up a percent in a year because you know sometimes it moves in a little bit of fits and starts okay and uh, you will see already the special on markets and uh, then you know rbi may just end the other central banks may go a little slow on you know for the rate hikes but yes over a longer period maybe over two years uh, uh, you know going past uh, eight for a home loan or even going to 8.5 cannot be ruled out i think we've covered all the bases thank you so much anil for taking the time appreciate speaking with you.